right, CFC, we're going to jump right in. Let me pray. I'll remind you where we're picking up on the series, the short series, and we'll dive into God's word together. Let's do that. Father, we're thankful that we have your word, that we don't, we don't have to wonder or guess, kind of stab in the dark, uh, what you're like, what you want, what you desire. Father, you teach us in your word. In this time, help us, help us to see it, to learn it, understand it, to live by it. So we ask for your grace now to give us understanding and to give us strength and wisdom to follow through on what we've understood. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, so we're in a short series right now that I introduced not last Sunday, but the Sunday before. And that is to answer a, a basic question. The question is, what makes up a Christian? And by way of reminder, the question is not, what makes you a Christian? In other words, the question is not, how do you become a Christian? How do you, how do you get a relationship with God? That answer we just talked about in our time of communion. That's through faith in Jesus Christ, his death, life, death, and resurrection on our behalf. But what the question is, is what does a Christian look like? And the reason why it's so important, have you ever known someone that seems like they walk the walk and talk the talk and then eventually they fell off? Are you disheartened when one of your favorite YouTube preachers, one of your favorite YouTube apologists has decades of ministry and then walks away? Their books were your favorite books. Their podcasts were your favorite podcasts. They walked away. Some of you have lost friends. Maybe even in this church, looked like a Christian, sounded like a Christian, we thought, and then walked away. There isn't any foolproof way to discern this person is, this person isn't. But there are some signs that Scripture talks about. So what we're looking at in this series, we're going to look at five attributes, five things that, that if somebody is a Christian, there should at least be these signs of life in in their life. Now, as we move through those and you take an assessment of your life, you're like, I don't think my life really looks like that. Well, then get on board <laughs> or, you know, have an honest assessment of your life. Do I think I'm a Christian because I said a prayer one time? Do I think I'm a Christian because I show up to a service on Sundays? Or is there, are there other signs pointing to maybe Maybe I'm not in. Maybe I'm doing a religious thing, but I don't really have a relationship with God. A relationship with God looks like something. And there are more than five things that we can talk about. I just want to try to limit it to five things that Scripture is clear about, loud about, that the church has really not disagreed about in centuries. These are not really arguable, debatable things among Christian communities. So this is not a CFC-specific thing. This is not what does a CFC member a CFC version of a Christian look like, this is much broader than that. And so it could be a time for us to just do, do sort of a health checkup and say, hey, am I really in or did I get confused somewhere along the way? Or an encouragement to say, yeah, I kind of do that, but I could do better. I should do better because Scripture calls us to it. And that's the rest of us, right? None of us are probably going to be like, check, I'm so stellar at that. Um, no, we're all going to be pushed a little bit. And the first thing that we're going to see clearly in Scripture is that someone who's in a relationship with God cares what God says. Someone who's a believer understands what they believe. Right? Someone who is a Christian studies the Bible. Study the Bible. So we're going to see that clearly in uh, Psalm 1, and then toward the end we'll look at a couple other scripture passages to kind of round it out and drive it home, but most of our time we'll just spend in Psalm 1. Now the first two Psalms kick off the entire book called the Psalms, 150 songs. They look like poems, they are really, it's poetry, uh, people call it wisdom literature, um, there's imagery, metaphor, 
they were put to songs at one time. We don't have the music now, but that's, this is basically a hymn book. Now, the first two psalms are like the intro. They, they set up what we're going to see thematically throughout all the psalms. But if we're going to sing about God, if we're going to sing to God, if we're going to gather as a congregation, we should know who we are first. And so the first two psalms are kind of like the identifiers. The first one, who's the, what does the person look like who's in? And then the second psalm is promising Christ will come and uh, deal with those who fight against him and his own. But let's look at Psalm 1 here. Psalm 1, the basic message inviting you to read all of the psalms and beyond the psalms, all of scripture. Why? Because the person who follows God, the person who's blessed by God is the person, is a person who loves to study God's word. All right, so this isn't about seminarians or pastors or your weird uncle who just quotes a lot of scripture. Anybody, anybody who follows the Lord, man, woman, child, anybody who follows the Lord looks like this. Verse 1, blessed is the man, the person, this is not just about males, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Let's unpack some of these terms, because even though we're, some of us are very familiar with this passage, we we would do well to think about what it's saying. Blessed is the person. We could think of blessing in any number of ways, but the way that the psalmist tends to use that word, blessing, is the joy of a relationship with God. It's not getting stuff, material gain necessarily, but, but the joy and the happiness that comes specifically from a relationship with God so that people who are not in a relationship with God aren't blessed in this way. Even if they have a big house and have a bunch of stuff and make a lot of money that if they're outside of the covenant relationship with God that's not blessing the blessed person is in covenant relationship with God and derives their joy from that so some translations say happy is the person but it it really is about blessing and happiness is a part of that blessing but it's not random happiness we are fickle people We're happy when we're feeling good. We're depressed when we're feeling bad. We're happy when we get the raise. We struggle with God when we get fired. And we're up and down, up and down. But the blessed person doesn't base happiness on circumstance. It's based on covenant. That doesn't change. That person is blessed. And then he starts off with what that person does not do. Here's what the, the Christian, the believer, the follower of God doesn't look like. And gives you three things that the blessed person, the follower of God, the Christian will say, doesn't do, does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, does not stand in the way of sinners, does not sit in the seat of scoffers. And I want you to see something here because it looks like there's a sort of uh, evolution of decay. As the person doesn't walk, and then what happens when you stop walking? You stand. And what happens when you stop standing? You sit. And so it's like this person starts walking with them, and then this person is standing with them, and then this person sitting with them. See, it's like the world is sucking you into its pattern, Romans 12. And this person does not get sucked into that pattern and does not devolve that way. This person doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. The wicked have lots of counsel. The world will tell you, here's what you should do. Here's what your life should look like. Here's what you should accept. Here's what you should believe. Here's what you should dedicate your time to. The world has its own counsel, and the blessed person doesn't give a rip about what the world says is wisdom. Doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked. Doesn't stand in the way of sinners. That doesn't mean blocking someone's path like, hey, can you get out of my way? It means standing in the way that sinners stand, that your life looks like them, or sitting in the seat of scoffers, I love how, I think it's interesting that the psalmist first uses the wicked, the sinners, and then scoffers is kind of different because the wicked and the sinful aren't just content 
to be their own selves and the blessed person be your own self. If you don't walk with us, you don't stand with us, you don't have a seat with us, we scoff at you. And so there's already this idea of persecution. That's why Psalm 2 is so important. Jesus comes to crush the oppression. But we are oppressed. If we live in a world that walks a certain way, stands a certain way, sits a certain way, and our posture is constantly different, of course we're going to catch heat for it. So that's what the blessed person doesn't do. We don't take counsel in the wicked. Where do we take our counsel? Verse 2, our delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law we meditate day and night. So I'm making it plural there because it's about all of us. The blessed person's delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. I love this verse, and I think it's, it, it's so helpful in many ways. Here's a couple reasons. One is, I love that it says, the law of the Lord. How many of us, the Bible passages we appreciate the most are the fun stories, and the Bible passages we appreciate the least are a bunch of do's and don'ts, and don't eat this, and don't wear that. We're like, ugh. Right? We kind of, we don't love rules. Your favorite time sitting with your parents maybe was story time as a kid, but not the lecture who likes the lecture, right? And this guy, is, he's not like, I love the parables. I love the songs. Why not? He's introducing the whole book of, of songs, right? I love the stories, the heroes. Well, he puts it in a way that means instruction. I love being told what to do and what not to do. That's the blessed person's posture. I actually enjoy the lectures. Just give it to me straight, man. What should I be doing and what shouldn't I be doing? His delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, that law doesn't mean he only delights in the particular places in Scripture that have legal code. He, all of it is God's instruction, right? All of Scripture is God's instruction. So you can interpret, uh, translate law as instruction there. But he loves the fact that it instructs. It's not just story time for him. He loves that it tells him how to live life. He delights in that. And then he meditates on it day and night. That word meditate is interesting. It's, it is the opposite of what other religions, some other religions teach about meditation. Clearing your mind. Med scriptural meditation is not clearing your mind. It's putting stuff in your mind. And what are you putting in your mind? God's word. So we're not emptying our minds, we're filling it, but we're filling it with the right thing, which is God's law, God's instruction, what he tells us, what he teaches us about himself and about ourselves. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night, this constant meditation. I don't think we're supposed to translate this. First thing in the morning, read God's word. Last thing at night, read God's word. Day and night, check the box. Although I'd rather you do that than be like, well, that's a metaphor, and not do it at all. I, I mean, if you can do day and night, that's awesome. But I think it's this constant when it's daytime and when it's nighttime. What time is left out? There is no time left out. It just means all the time, all the time. Whether the sun's up or the sun's down, there's this constant meditation on God's word. That doesn't mean the Bible's always open in front of you. Every second, you can't do anything else. But it does mean while you're commuting, while you're working, while you're talking with people, God's word is the background music to all of it for you. And that word meditate, some people tell you, well, it, it kind of means like murmuring, and it's true. If you see somebody kind of walking back and forth, like, you know, like kind of talking to themselves and murmuring, right? Or... Uh, you know, you're in a meeting and you announce something and you see people turning to each other, murmur, murmur. <laughs> people are talking, but it's not really discernible. That's true. That's what the word means. But it's muttering on purpose. Now, I want to point something out important to you. Drop your eyes down to chapter 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain, right? You've got people that plot against the Lord. 
What does that mean? To plot against them. They plan it, right? Same word. Hagah. The word for meditate and the word for plot is the same. So he doesn't mean random like murmurings that don't have any thought or plan to it. It's intentional. It's thoughtful. Now, you, you can imagine the nations gathering together, murmur, murmur, right? What, what are they murmuring about? How do we get God out of our lives? But the Christian meditates, murmurs, talks about, thinks about, studies how to get more of God in my life. I want to know what he looks like. I want to know what he thinks. I want to study it. I also want you to notice in verse 2, delight drives the meditation, not sheer duty. If I just tell you today, guys, you've got to study God's word. You've got to study God's word or you're not a Christian. Some of you might go home like, okay, seriously, I've got to study God's word. I'm going to put it in my calendar. That's only going to last so long. How many of us have already tried that? You know, New Year's resolution or something like that? Now, you tried it, and then it kind of teeters off. I think it's because we have to delight in it first. We don't really stick to the things that we really don't like. We don't like it. But you notice here, he delights in the law, and because he delights in it, that drives his constant meditation in it. We do the things we like to do. If there's already a joy there, we tend and gravitate toward those things that we enjoy. His delight is in the law, and then he meditates on it day and night. Now, I don't think that means you're always going to click your heels about Bible time. I, I just don't think, I don't think that's realistic. Think of somebody who's a neat freak. Okay, maybe you just don't have to think about anybody but yourself because you are a neat freak. I don't know. Maybe it's you. Maybe you're married to a neat freak. I don't know. A neat freak, they like to clean. Now, does that mean a neat freak, whatever you want to call them, an obsessively neat person? Does that mean any day of the week, at any time, no matter what time of day it is, what they feel like doing above all else is cleaning? All the time? Now, sometimes I'll be like, yeah. You know. But all the time, never want to relax, never want to do. I think that's a, probably a pretty rare person that only ever wants to clean, never has a desire for anything else. But I think we call them neat freaks because on the whole, they just hate messes. They hate clutter, and they'll do what it takes to put it in order so they can relax, right? Get rid of the anxiety of clutter. On the whole. And I think that this is, this is what it's talking about. It doesn't mean any day of the week at any time, you can't think of anything but cracking open scripture. I just got to get home from work. Maybe I should quit my job. I could study all day. You know, no. Right? But on the whole, there is a desire. And if a day goes by, a week goes by, a month goes by, man, a year goes by, more than one year, and somebody asks you, hey, when's the last time you cracked open scripture and just poured into it? And you're like, um, I was at church last Sunday. No, no, no. Aside from sort of being forced to gather and being spoon-fed the word, just studying God's word, meditating on it. When was the last time? Oh, I don't know. I think the answer is not, okay, let me, let me strap down and get to it. I think we need to address why don't I delight in it? Because if I delight in it, then I will do it. And so we need to ask the Lord to stoke that delight in us. If there's zero delight there, it might be because I'm not a Christian. Right? There has to be a change of heart. This new creation loves God's law. If I don't really have much love for it at all, not much concern for it, that might be a sign, hey, I need to get back to what, what is the good news in the first place. How, what does a relationship with God look like? But if you just kind of feel like, man, it's up and down. Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm out. We can ask God for the grace to stoke that in us and develop that in us. But I adjure you, don't go home just like, man, I've got to put Bible study in my calendar. Although I think we'll get to some application. I think that's a good thing. But you've got to ask God for the delight so that we can take joy in it. And that will drive the meditation. I 
think like many other things, uh, we just have to grapple with the fact that this is how it is. I think some of us are like, man, I just don't like words, and I don't like studying, and I don't like reading, you know? Like, I like other things. I'm just not that, that nerdy. I struggled in school, whatever. But at the end of the day, right, at the end of the day, Jesus is the word of God. I mean, God created the world through speaking and then revealed himself to us through words. Now, that's just how it is, right? Some of us might enjoy words more than others, but that doesn't give us a pass. Like, hey, I just, you know, whatever. It's kind of like dieting. You go to the doctor, the doctor's like, hey, bad numbers, you've got to start watching what you eat. I'm not really into dieting, you know what I'm saying? Ah, my sister's into dieting, my, you know, my parents are really into dieting, but me, I don't care. Yeah, I can tell. Look at the scale, right? Whether you're into dieting or not, if you're not careful what you eat, that's going to have an effect on your health, period. That's just how the world is. We don't, we don't get to just say, well, dieting is for some people, right? You, now, some people diet different ways. And we don't all do it, approach it the same exact way. And we'll do it to different levels of success. But if you care about your health, you have to care about the intake of calories. It's just, it's just how it works. It's just how the world is. Now, we can try to have a gripe with God. Why did you use words? Why didn't you use pictures? Why didn't you use more songs? Or why, how about just feelings? Take that up with the Lord. But he communicates himself through words. It's just, it's just how he's com decided to relate to his people and has commanded us to learn those things. And that's what discipleship is, isn't it? Jesus commissioned his disciples to go into all the world and do what? What do we make? Disciples. The word disciple means student. And so to be a Christian is to be in a learning mode, period. Period. Doesn't mean we all go to seminary. That's now we're talking about levels, levels of learning, right? But but we're students. And as students make other students, we don't just baptize them, but what do we do? We teach them all that Christ has commanded us. Okay, to make a student, you teach. And what do we teach them? What God says. Jesus didn't make that up. He's saying, we're going to take Psalm 1 and extend that to the world. But as people follow me, they become Psalm 1 people. They delight in the law of the Lord and they meditate on it all the time. Now he talks about the effect. The Bible student, the person who's blessed by God and is interested in God's word, delights in God's word, studies God's word, prospers in those who don't face destruction. 3 through 6, Psalm 1, 3 through 6. The blessed person, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. So the tree is the blessed person, and the streams of water is the word of God, right? The tree, so he's just, he took verse 1 and 2 and turned it into a metaphor. The tree is the blessed person, and how does that blessed person gain the nutriment that he needs or she needs to have leaves that are green instead of withered? What is that water that pours into the roots and goes up the trunk? And I'm going to start forgetting all my anatomy of a plant, but how does that happen? The water is the law of the Lord. And that drinking up of the water is the meditation, day and night. And then what's the effect? Prosperity. And all that he does, verse 3, and all that he does, he prospers. Sometimes it doesn't look like that, feel like that. We know that the Lord uses challenges and disciplinary action to conform us to Christ, and that's in his wisdom. But on the whole, on the whole, your family will flourish. If you raise your kids on the word of God, on the whole, your marriage will flourish. If you center your marriage on the word of God. On the whole, people who disregard the Bible in their marriage, they, they don't address the Bible with their kids, 
They teach their kids more about their favorite sport than they do about the Bible. That will have an adverse effect in your family and in your child rearing and in your children's lives. That's what the wicked do. They ignore God's word. So what's their life like? Verse 4, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. They're separated from God. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Even if it doesn't look like it now, that is their end. That's not the end of the person who's blessed of God. As they draw nutriment from God's word, their life looks a certain way, and they're headed toward life, not destruction, and death. And the person that is headed in that direction looks like something. And they look like somebody who is a Bible student, studies God's word. What's difficult about the sermons in these series is just it's just simple. I'm not not giving you anything that's brand new, but I want to remind us this is what we're supposed to be about. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Take a look at your life and ask yourself, do I study God's word? If I don't, that's a problem. Because scripture just makes it so clear. We delight in it. Why don't I delight in it? If I delight in it, why don't I do it? I want prosperity. I want my life to flourish and grow. I want God's blessing in my life. Well, God doesn't leave us guessing how does that happen. It happens through the study of God's word and delighting in it. And it averts destruction. Your life and your eternity depend on where you take counsel. And you're going to take counsel from somewhere. Well, Psalm, the psalmist is telling us to take counsel in God's word. Okay, so here's the point. The blessed person, the blessed person, the Christian, the believer, is someone who delights in studying God's word. The first in our sharp series, the S is study scripture. Christian studies scripture. And I want to just point out a few things here and then a couple verses and we'll close. One of those things is to not take the Bible, to not take Bible study in a backwards way. And what I mean by that is think about, and maybe some of us, you know, probably many of us have said this in class when you were, think back when you were in school and you were a student and you were getting force fed all this kind of math or you were in English lit and reading some dead poet person and you're like, who cares? Who, who cares about meter and rhyme and blank verse like I'm never going to use this in my career you got to some upper level in math you're like I'm, I'm never I am never going to find you know a <laughs> in some hard to understand formula I'm, I'm never going to do it but but think about what is the alternative should teachers sit you down and be like hey what do you think your career is going to be I want to be a veterinarian. Okay, so you don't need English literature because you're going to be working on animals. So let's only teach you math. And then narrow your path, narrow what you understand, and only feed you what you think you're going to need. Would you be pleased with a school that did that? It's, It's backwards, right? The understanding is to give a broad understanding, not based on what you think your career is going to be. And by the way, it's not just career. You're sitting at a table, the server gave you the bill, and you got to calculate tip. Everyone's staring at you. You pull out the clicky pen, and you're like, uh, I need to go to the bathroom. You're in the bathroom trying to do math. Right? We have a broad education that prepares us for specific circumstances. We don't wait until specific circumstances and then pull out a math book. And try to learn, what does a percentage mean? That weird line with the two circles on either side of it, what does that mean? Oh, that's percentage. Oh, let me look that up real quick while the waiter waits. As absurd as that is, that's how we sometimes treat the Bible. We let it collect dust until something hits our lives like, oh, what's the scripture for this one? Let me find it. It, 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 That's not really how it works. We meditate in God's word. It gives us a broad understanding of life. So when specifics come up, you're not looking for the verse on how to dump a boyfriend. But the broad understanding of of Scripture prepares you for life in general, not to find one verse to apply to one thing. And that's to say the Bible is not a manual. 
it, it's not a manual. If I was working on the car yesterday, I had to find the lift point. How do I find the lift point? I check the manual, right? I don't study the manual all day. I don't wake up in the morning, cup of tea, and just read the first chapter of the car's manual. But when we treat scripture like a manual, we let it collect dust, and we only delight in it when a problem comes up. And then we go look for the verse that applies to that problem, and that's not how God wrote it. So I think we need to think of scripture more as a, a profile, not a set of manual, not a manual set of instructions. It's a profile. It is instructive because as we learn the profile of what God looks like and the profile of what a Christian is supposed to look like in response to what God looks like, that profile, that's instructive. The stories, the parables, the villains and the heroes, the legal code, right, the prophecies, the warnings, all of those different kinds of scripture, the weird imagery and, and apocalyptic, right, beasts coming out of the ocean and wheels within wheels, all this stuff profiles what God is like and what we're supposed to be like, and that's instructive for us. But we study it, we study it not to get the specific answer to my specific question that I have on Monday morning. We study it because we delight in God. And as we delight in him and delight in what he says, as specific situations come up, we're going to have wisdom for those things. But we don't start there. We start with delight in the law of the Lord. We delight in it because it's God's law. It's the law of Yahweh, not the book of answers. That, I think, will help us understand not to take God's word backwards, taking it sort of as a response to specific situations, but instead letting it wash over us, nourish us, change us, mature us. And there are going to be mornings, there are going to be evenings, brothers and sisters, where you read an entire passage and you're not sure what you got out of it. Don't worry about it. You don't always have to write down, what I got out of this was this specific thing I'm supposed to do. Just let it teach you about what God is like. And some of it is scary. Is God scary? Kind of. Let it scare you. Sometimes it's encouraging. Man, I was feeling down, and this is just reminding me of this good thing I need to remember. But let it wash over you, nourish you, and even if it doesn't prepare you for something specific each time you read it, over time it changes you as a person. And that will prepare you for specifics. So let's look at just a couple of verses real quick. I'll throw them up on the screen. But first, just as a reminder, that God's word serves as a guide to you. Again, not as a manual that you pull out of the glove box in certain occasions. But as you continue to read it, the light gets brighter. And as that light gets brighter, you can see the path in front of you better. Right? So it's not a flashlight you only pull out when you feel like you're about to stumble. You just have the light out, and as you study it, it becomes brighter, and it guides you. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. If that was written today, it would be like, it's my flashlight. It's my headlamp, right? These are my headlights, so I can see where I'm going. It's guidance. It's also protection. Psalm 119, verse 9, and then verse 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. How do I maintain a life that's pure, the way God wants it, reading God's word. What happens if I don't read God's word? Your way is not guarded. Pretty simple. Verse 11, I have stored up your word in my heart. Why? Why do I store up your word in my heart? I don't just read it. I try to study it, meditate it, understand it. Why? So that I don't sin against you. Right? So some of us are like, I'm not going to sin this week. I'm going to stop it. Stop it. Like willpower. And scripture is saying, well, it's not willpower. It's drinking deeply from the word of God, and that'll determine the kind of tree you are and the kind of fruit you produce. But the tree is not there like, oh, I'll, I'll think about water later, but I'm just going to be a strong tree today, right? It's, it's this constant meditation on God's word. That prepares you, even when the times where you don't feel like you have willpower. So here's a couple points of application real quickly. One, I think you should spend personal time in God's word. If your only time is when someone's preaching at you on a Sunday, that's not great. That's not you meditating on God's word constantly, day and night. Grab a Bible, some translation, and start somewhere. Start somewhere. Now, initially, I was thinking, man, just, I want to say, just read a verse. Unfortunately, that's not good enough. And the reason why is imagine somebody tells you, hey, how's your day? You're like, well, yesterday my boss yelled at me, and then they walk away. 
Would that be rude? You didn't get to communicate your point. You just said one line and they walked away, right? That's why it's not good to read a verse. Verses belong in chunks called paragraphs. I'm not trying to be nerdy. I'm just trying to keep you from cutting God off. He starts speaking and you're like, I'm done. Let me check the sports. Let me check the, how the Sox do last night, you know. So let God at least get something out. And I think that would at least be a paragraph. That's what a paragraph is, a thought, right? Now, hopefully your delight turns that into another paragraph. And like some of y'all know how to binge Netflix series. You thought you were just going to watch one episode. And then before you know it, you're knocking back some Mountain Dew because you've got to get to that final episode. You want, I mean, I hope that eventually the spirit stoked something in you where you thought you were going to start with a paragraph, ended up into a chapter. You thought you were going to stop at a chapter that ended up reading the whole book. And you want to know more about this weird character that you didn't encounter before. You never really thought about it before. And how this intersects with your life and you're so excited about it, you want to talk to somebody else. That's the ideal. But many of us don't start there. Some of us are going to start like, oh, all right, paragraph. You start reading it. You're like, I'm three verses in. I don't understand what's going on. Keep going. Keep going. Just like you come home from the doctor's office and you, you stink and hate carrots. You know, like I don't want kale in my diet at all. Like I don't, I hate kale. Start somewhere, right? Start somewhere and just, I'm just going to eliminate soda or I'm just going to start by introducing just one vegetable a day, one piece of vegetable a day. You start somewhere and over time you progress and you mature in that thing that you're doing. So start with a dedicated personal time. In my opinion, I don't have a scripture passage for this, I think you should start your day with it. I think you should start your day with it. Prepare your heart and mind to deal with everything that this day is going to throw at you by spending time in God's word. And for many years, I did it at night because I thought, that's, I just am more awake at night. I'm just not a morning person. And I found it's more beneficial for me, even if it's one eye open, to start with the nutriment of God's word, then allow the whole day to transpire and then try to catch up at the end. I don't have a verse for that, it's my opinion, but I think you want to try to find ways to get it in. Maybe it's lunch break, something like that, or maybe you do it at night, but make sure that you get it in, and that will stoke your delight, and that delight will drive meditation. I also think you should consider studying with other people. Let me point something out to you. This person seems like they start out alone, right? This person doesn't stand with the group, the wicked, the wicked is plural. The sinners, plural. The scoffers, plural. The blessed man, singular. So this person, it seems like they start out walking this narrow, singular path by himself, and he avoids the crowd of the people. But then it's reversed. And at the end, the wicked are the ones that don't stand in judgment, and those sinners, they don't get a seat. They're the ones that don't get a seat. And where don't they get a seat? Verse 5. Psalm 1, verse 5. Look at it. Where don't the sinners get a seat? The congregation, that's people, plural. And so the blessed person does not go it alone. The blessed person belongs to a community of people. And so we don't just meditate on God's law by ourselves, what I think it says, and I don't care what anyone else thinks it says. We are going to be corrected by the interpretation of others, and we go, oh, yeah, I didn't see it that way. I think I had it wrong. And you're going to be able to lend insight to other people as well. This is why we have things like growth groups, so we can get together and meditate on God's law together, right? And I, I want y'all to hold each other to it as well. Like, hey, have you been spending time in God's word? And allow them to ask you the same question. This is why we have CFC courses, so we can kind of push in our understanding of God's word, so we can meditate on it. Last thing I'll say, and we'll close. You remember when Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit right after he's baptized, he's led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness. Remember that? Okay. And Jesus is led out into the wilderness, and he's tempted on these three different occasions by Satan. And Satan is tempting him, using his hunger as a way to get him to break his fast. Remember that? Turn these rocks into bread, if you're the son of God kind of thing, right? And you remember that Jesus' response to Satan in that instance 
Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8 and says, no, I, I don't need to eat physical bread because God taught back in Deuteronomy 8, God taught Israel when Israel was in the wilderness and when Israel was hungry, God taught Israel, I made you hungry on purpose. And the reason why I made you hungry is so you can appreciate the manna, the bread that you didn't bake, the bread that you didn't get from the store. You just opened your tent in the morning and there's bread on the ground, right? And Deuteronomy 8 makes it very clear. God tells Israel, I did that on purpose. And the reason why I did that is so that you would learn this lesson. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, each and every one of us as a Christian, we're on a journey. We're trekking through the wilderness, right? We're not in the land of promise yet. We're not in the land of rest yet. But we've been saved and we've been rescued out of slavery. So we're in this in-between time. And in this in-between time, what does God want to teach us? Sometimes he'll bring something into your life to make you particularly hungry. And then wants to teach you, the reason why I allowed that job loss or that heartbreaking breakup or that difficulty in your home or that difficulty at work, the reason why I allowed that is to make you hunger for me. So you understand that you don't live by your career. You don't live by how well your relationships are going. You don't live by your marriage and you don't live by your kids. You live by what I say. That's what you live by. So does God sometimes take something from you, snatch something from you to make it hurt? Yes. Why? So that you can depend on manna. That's why. Israel ultimately failed in the wilderness. That's why Jesus had to come and do the wilderness successfully because Israel couldn't do it. But Jesus didn't say, hey, I did the wilderness so that you don't have to care about what God says. I did the wilderness successfully so that I can get you through it. So that I can get you through it. And we do it the same way Jesus did it, by his power and by his grace. How do we survive trials and temptations? By not just depending on the physical things in front of us. By being zealous students of God's word, delighting in it and meditating on it all the time. Brothers and sisters, go study God's word. Let's pray.